Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. My name is Camden Busey. By my count, we're on episode number 764. I'm back again in Libertyville, Illinois, and I'm delighted to be back with one of my former professors speaking about an important subject we have with us today, none other than Dr. Vern Poitras, who is Distinguished Professor of New Testament, Biblical Interpretation, and Systematic Theology at Westminster Theological Seminary in Glenside, Pennsylvania. How are you doing, Dr. Poitras? It's so good to see you today. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. It's good to see you too. It's been a little while since we've since we've talked on the on the podcast, but we know you've been a guest for many many times. You've written so many books and uh, all helpful ones. And today's book is in line with many of the the more recent previous uh, previous titles. Today we're speaking about redeeming our thinking about history, a God centered approach. This is published by. Crossway. Um, I received this. They mailed it to me. So I uh, forgive me, listeners, if uh, it's not available yet. If you go to the website, I'm not certain if it's been published quite yet. If it hasn't, it will be soon. Uh, it doc, is do you know? There. Is it out? Is it available? Good. That's good to know. Uh, I love this book, and I'm looking forward to talking about uh, this topic today. Just before we get started, i got a few things just to mention. Please uh, uh, head on over to our website at reformedforum.org. We have a lot of courses and uh, new books, uh, various things that are available uh, for your benefit. And uh, we especially want to point people to a new book by Dr. Tipton, uh, Van Til's Trinitarian Theology. Well, technically, it's the Trinitarian Theology of Cornelius Van Til. I know that's a subject that you're very interested in, Dr. Poitras, speaking about the Trinity and very much indebted to the work of Dr. Van Til as well. And uh, encouraged there uh, for people to learn more about this, because I think it's a topic that, that People have caricatured Van Til on and haven't put the time in to understand exactly what he's been saying. And uh, we're glad to be able to at least renew and and uh, revisit the conversation uh, with primary sources uh, in conversation with, uh, with the creeds and confessions, going back to Calvin and even more recently with Old Princeton, the Hodges and Bavink. Uh, it's, it's a great conversation. We look forward to having that on the program even more. Dr. Porches, did you receive your copy yet? I know we were sending one I out to you. I did, and I actually I read the whole thing. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Well, maybe I'll uh, let you reserve your comments for um, your critical comments, but I hope at least uh, it, uh, it was beneficial and you thought it was useful. Yes, it was. So. Oh, good. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we're thankful for that. So uh, delighted to, to be able to do that um, and looking forward to... Uh, thinking about even maybe how the Trinity might come into our conversation today. There's certainly themes of unity and diversity at work throughout history as we speak about God uh, revealing himself in space and time and dealing with his church uh, throughout the ages. That's really in many ways the subject matter of our book today, redeeming our thinking about history. Dr. Poitras, I want to ask you first up, um, you know, you've certainly done extensive work in mathematics, PhD from Harvard. You've done tremendous amount of work over the decades in New Testament, but you've been branching out in the last decade or so, uh, addressing a God-centered approach to all sorts of disciplines. Um, What brought you to the subject of history? I'm glad you you were brought here, and I'm glad you wrote this book, but I'm curious uh, to get a little bit of the background on this particular title. Yes, well, it's a good question, and I think one one point is that I do... um, believe that a Kuiper, Abraham Kuiper was on target. And yeah. His emphasis on Christ as Lord of all of life and every square inch <laughs> he's mm-hmm. claiming as his own. And so all the academic disciplines, but also beyond that, you know, right, work, leisure, music, and so on, mm-hmm. everything is under his universal lordship. So history is one of those areas. Uh, but I honestly, I didn't want to do it because I really? didn't feel, <laughs> yeah, I didn't feel that it was so close to the areas where I really felt comfortable mm. talking about because my background's in science. But my wife is really yes. uh, interested in history. She did her dissertation on. Uh, uh, Johannes Ecolampadius in the Reformation, the reformer at Basel, and included a, a biography of him. And she she loves to dig into the Reformation period and 
and the people, it's not just the theology, you understand, but the people and the uh, excitement of the movement and, and the tragedies, right? Because, because there's fights and there's uh, things that you could wish went another way. But uh, so she was very uh, interested in that. And uh, she, like me, is um, believes in Van Til, of course, is the person who we talked about Van Til. Van Til was <laughs> the person who, above all, mediated Abraham Kuyper's vision to me mm. uh, and introduced me to uh, to what he was doing. And she's influenced by that, too. She's influenced by Van Til and mm -hmm. Kuyper. So the first part of her dissertation was on the fact that you can actually write uh, about history in a way that pays attention to the providence of God. She yeah. had to defend that. So she was at it uh, before I was. Uh -huh. Then th there was a festrip that was drawn up for me, and she was invited to write on, in that, and she wrote basically on a uh, Christian approach to uh, writing history, Christian mm -hmm. uh, view of historiography, a uh, chapter on that. And, uh, and in the chapter, she said, well, it, really, we should have a book. <laughs> and you got assigned <laughs> yeah well <clears throat> uh so so in a way i thought you know somebody who is who is more uh, experienced with reading and writing history than i am mm -hmm. should do it but as i talked to people and my wife was one of them i talked to mm -hmm. but jeff waddington of, of yeah, your of our friend mm -hmm. he was another one who said look you ought to do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And finally, I decided, you know, it's probably not going to be done. At least it's not going to be done the way I want it to be done. Sure. Uh, from uh, 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 with the background of, of Reformed theology and Van Til, too. Right. And Kuiper to do it in that way. So I better do it. Uh, it's not going to be perfect, but I'll do my best. Yeah. Right. And uh and it was partly that people were saying this is a really important area because there's a lot of naivety about it, particularly, well, it affects uh, the history recorded in the Bible because the historical critical movement has said we, ha we have to be skeptical about that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's completely contrary to uh, the acknowledgement of the divine authorship of Scripture. So that has to be addressed. But it has been addressed over and over again by you know, orthodox theologians. So mm -hmm. biblical history, that's been defended as in terms of we can believe what the Bible says happened. That's been defended many times. So the area of ex, what you might call extra biblical history, right? The, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the, the time of Napoleon, right? The, the time of the Reformation, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the time of uh, uh, colonialism and European colonialism, uh, the time of right now, what do we do in analyzing that kind of thing? Is there a specifically Christian way of doing it? Well, mm -hmm. I believed that 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 needed addressing and the naivety is saying, well, we just go out and look at the facts. <laughs> yeah, right? right. And uh, yeah, so so um, my, that was the background of what I tried to do in, in my book and to address partly what the Bible says about the events that it records, but also that it has a philosophy of history. And, and when you think about that, that's an ultimate framework that influences everybody that's looking at history, whether they acknowledge it or not. It's often a kind of uh, unconscious background, right? People yes. have absorbed the materialism of it's all matter in motion, right? That leads to a certain view of history. Well, the Bible, it's creation, fall, redemption, consummation. We 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 have a distinctive view. <laughs> we sure, and it's we sure pretty do. evident, that, that, you know, and, that, and, it, and it means that there's purpose in everything. It's mm -hmm. God's purposes. Now, not all of those are transparent to us, but if God is a universal controller, and this is, again, uh, you know, the Reformed emphasis and Kytherian emphasis, Every single thing, every hair that is numbered on my head and every sparrow that falls to the ground, mm -hmm. all of that is according to the plan of God. And all of it has meaning. Mm -hmm. We can't penetrate all the meaning, 
But our starting point is with this, you might call it philosophy of history. It's not philosophy is a is a difficult word because right. it's not just ideas, right? But it's an announcement of God's plan that also engages us and says, you can be redeemed by Christ and enter into the consummation. And that, so it's personally engaging, right? It's not just out there of, oh, well, you know, this is the meaning of history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> meaning my personal life is in, at stake as well. Mm -hmm. Clearly. No, that's wonderful. I, I, I would like to make one brief correction. Your wife effectively wrote two dissertations on Ecolombadius. If you go to the uh, to the archives of the library, if I'm not mistaken, it was such a substantial work that it's uh, bound in two volumes. Uh, and we've been able to interview her on that. So if anyone's interested, I'll, I will hope to put a link to those uh, conversations in the episode description, but just phenomenal. Uh, the work on Ecolampadius in the, the wider context as well. So she's done tremendous work there. And yeah, it's been published as RHB, we, a shorter version. We, yeah, published. we could go along <laughs> about that because I believe Ecolampadius himself was a phenomenal yes. a Christian man. Uh, but but the, the two-volume dissertation is pretty uh, formidable, but she yeah. wrote a shorter, more accessible thing called... called uh, what is it? The the reformer of Basel. Yes, uh, from Reformation right. Heritage Books, I believe, yeah. and we spoke about that as well. So you know that gives the ordinary person a chance to yeah uh, to feel what it was like, and and Eclampadius was in his own day really a weighty influence. Yeah, uh, not very well known today, but right, he influenced uh, Abutzer and Calvin. Uh, uh, and and Luther, he had dialogues with Luther mm -hmm. as well. I want to pick up on some themes that you've already or just opened up uh, right along the lines of some questions I had been dying to ask you already. But uh, before that, I would I would just like to ask about uh, your relationship with your wife Diane. She, of course, is an accomplished historian. But I'm curious how your relationship and your marriage uh, throughout the years and your interaction. Uh, as Doctor's Poitras, uh, and you've you've got a son who's also a doctor too, <laughs> and another one who's quite engaged uh, theologically. So it's quite the theological house. But how has your view of history, as well as your view of historiography, developed over the years? How has uh, your wife uh, influenced your own thinking on the subject? Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I'm going to disappoint you, I think, because I <laughs> think the answer is not much, because uh, I was already that way when we were married. Uh, we were already, you know, in, in a yeah. frame and feeling that that uh, uh, writing history in a way that acknowledged God's providence mm -hmm. was a profitable way of doing it. But mm -hmm. then she made that explicit in her dissertation. Well, I saw that happening because... You know, I was sort of looking over her shoulder, so to speak, <laughs> as she wrote the dissertation, and and uh, and she had to, uh, the, her advisor said, if you're going to write this way, you have to defend methodologically why you're doing it. Sure. But Westminster was good because it allowed that kind of thing. This was not a, a typical dissertation, <laughs> yes, right. so you can imagine, because a typical one pretends to be have this kind of academic neutrality right the objectivity and, mm -hmm. yeah and not to talk about god's hand of providence yeah it's important that we recognize that that this christian approach to history and historiography i hope to define those things in a minute but along those lines when you're speaking here this kyperian project that you're engaged in uh writing a god-centered approach to a variety of disciplines you've written on on many sociology you've written on linguistics, uh, mathematics, science, logic, you know, that, and, and emphasizing this common refrain that we must have a God-centered approach in all of these disciplines in order to undertake them and to engage in them rightly, faithfully, as God's creatures, as his image bearers. Um, it's certainly the case, though, that we recognize that many of the people that are engaging in these disciplines, especially mathematics and science, haven't actually even thought much about their approach or their their explicit methodology and even more so about the presuppositions undergirding those methods. 
Do you believe that's the case for historians as well, that there's general ignorance about method or at least the presuppositions undergirding um, unbelieving uh, methods? Yeah, I'm less certain about that. I think that it's probably true of many historians that as it is with many natural scientists, that they go through a program, they go through a training, and a lot of it is sort of in the atmosphere. You don't talk explicitly about what the methods are, but you learn to do them. But with historians, I know there's quite a bit of discussion because there's been shifts in the attitude toward how history ought to be written over the centuries. And uh, Ranke, for instance, his idea of, of a positivistic history where mm -hmm. we're going to be very minutely going after primary sources. It's just a reasonable thing to do. Sure. But then we're not going to bring in kind of a subjective or moral evaluation. So it was that kind of thing uh, influenced the way historians wrote. Uh, and now we've got postmodernism with it saying, basically, you're inventing the story. Yeah. <laughs> Right, where they're not after the objective facts at all. There's no meta narrative. If you create your own, that's that because of the pluralism created by postmodernism. Maybe there are more people that are feeling I have I have to defend the way I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, I could see that, um, and I certainly don't disagree. Um, it, there, that there there um, isn't necessarily methodological awareness from everyone but at least there are it is a discipline and people are dealing with it and some are de seeking to defend their approach um and and doing so vigorously often against uh christ and in his kingdom um you know in part one of uh, your book here, you title this, What We Need in Order to Analyze History. And you, you start setting the stage in very helpful ways, speaking about categories and, and setting the table for us as we discuss. The first uh, chapter in that section is called Experiencing History, and you define the very word. Um, at least for us today, how should we consider history, or what are the ways that we might define it, and which ways are we concerned with as Christians? Yeah, well... <clears throat> Part of the difficulty is that there there can be confusion arising from two or three different yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, meanings. Uh, one meaning of history is the events in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but another meaning is the events as they're received, because a lot has been lost. Right? It is irrecoverable from the human point of view. God knows it all, which is, uh, I think, gives a Christian actually an anchorage even though we can't recover, we know it's real. <laughs> uh, and it's there in the mind of God forever. So there is an objectivity of that kind. Uh, but there's there's the recoverable past, you might say. And then there's the past that you write up. And in the course of writing something up, you're selective. You're taking a point of view. You're, you're uh, analyzing if you're evaluating people and their motives it gets very tricky because people are complicated but without the personal element in history history tends to get boring uh, so so there is a lot of interest in you know what what was going on in napoleon's mind or what was going on in churchill's mind and that kind of thing and the depiction of individuals key individuals but you can't get very far in doing that without understand getting into the issue of the complexity of human personality and human decision making and for us who believe in the lord god it's always against the background of divine decision making and divine plan uh, as well so that personal element is indispensable uh, the people in the Germany, particularly, they tended to contrast the natural sciences and the social sciences, because the social sciences, you yourself were involved. Well, in fact, in natural science, you're still involved. <laughs> <laughs> but but it is true that it's as if there's an order of magnitude more of, of um, uh, as it were, direct personal involvement, because mm. in assessing other people, you assess them against the background of what you think makes people tick 
one of the things that comes out, I hope, in my volume is the interest in people's religious commitments. Sure. Some historians are interested and others are not. And a, because of the secularization of the West, religion has come to be think of some private, private kind of psychological help. It really isn't very important. But in many cultures of the world, it actually fills people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's one of the main integrating things about the culture. And so uh, finding out about people's religion or lack thereof, right, or secular counterfeits to it, is actually an important element in historical research. And that's one area where Christians have contributed, I think, because they reminded in the midst of a lot of secularization, they reminded, yeah, you can add, there's actually important things to see <laughs> about people yeah. if you ask how their own religious commitments contributed to their life. Right. That's not, of course, it's not the only thing we should be asking, but it's certainly one that we should be asking. And I do believe the Kuyperian influence has been a good one here because some of Kuyper and his followers emphasized all of life is religion. Mm -hmm. And everybody is innately religious, even the atheists, mm -hmm. because they have a religious commitment to atheism. <laughs> yeah, they absolutely do. So, so, you know, that has to be carefully um, explained in order for it to make sense and not to be sound like a contradiction. But mm -hmm. I do think people's deepest motives, they're serving something, right? It's either they're serving the true God or they're serving an idol. Right. And that actually is an important opening uh, window for understanding uh, the, the issue of human motivations. Yes. Yeah. The antithesis is certainly in effect and uh, definitely at work. We need to be aware of it as historians and those studying history. That did come through very strongly in your book. I love also how you introduce these three aspects uh, that we need to consider, three foundations for historical analysis. And you consider uh, events and people and meaning. So we've spoken about people and we can consider the events of history, but events aren't necessarily that interesting apart from the people. We don't necessarily just study the history of atoms, for example, <laughs> independent of, of human agency uh, in the world. But how do these three fit together and, and uh, how, is, how is this a useful way to think about history, events, people, and meanings? Right. Well, I treat them as perspectives and I'm building off uh, a frames triad mm -hmm. of perspectives for ethics. And, you know, ethics, if you use it expansively, uh, all of human life has a moral, ethical dimension, particularly mm -hmm. if you include in that that the foundation of morality is the goodness of God, right? Mm -hmm. And the character of God. So it's innately religious. So that's an expansive view. Well, then when you apply that to history, what you get is a normative, situational, and existential perspective on history. A normative perspective looks at, uh, well, not necessarily only ethical norms, but also the meanings, which are kind of like norms for the meanings of what is going on. The situational perspective leads to the focus on events. What is the situation out there? What actually happened? And Ranke, for all his problems, he did uh, uh, encourage the development of very minute and fussy, <laughs> in a good sense of fussy, attention to primary documents and to verifying um, claims for uh, that events happen in a certain way. So, and as Christians, you know, that's in line with the Christian belief that God is God of truth. So he cares about truth. He not only knows what happened, but it's, it's uh, significant for us to pursue the truth and not to, uh, not to uh, be slack in applying ourselves and trying to establish what actually happened. Particularly, I'm thinking now, of course, of extra biblical history, right, where, where we're dealing with fallible human sources. And then the third one is the, the people. Well, that's related to Frame's existential perspective. But all three of those are unintelligible without the other two together. And because the meanings, if there's no events, there's no meanings, right? And uh, 
And if there's no people, as you say, atoms yeah. in motion, not really very interested. <laughs> and even the atoms there's in no, motion, yeah. if there's no persons. No ethical there's aspect God, to it. No significance. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's no significance. So, mm -hmm. and of course, God is the ultimate tripersonal God mm -hmm. who is there and without whom there is no meaning or events or human persons. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's my ultimate root is to is to take it all back to God, that God has ordained both events and human actors and meanings, the meanings mm -hmm. of his plan, ultimately, all three together in harmony because he's one God. I think without that, people tend to get into all kinds of naughty problems yeah. in their analysis of history because they, they haven't got a sufficient account of why do these things hold together hormones yeah this reminds me of uh something that came up in a sermon i was preaching last night on uh malachi chapter three uh and all that dialogue between the lord through malachi and the people and uh the lord keeps saying things to them and then they question him he says you're robbing me and he says how have we robbed you or they're questioning what's the profit in following after the lord like why should i be obedient because it looks like the the wicked are the ones that prosper in this world and that would be a just a fundamental breakdown here of this view of history because they might even get the events correct so to speak in terms of the the bare data but they don't have a godly interpretation of things. It's not enough for us just to uncover and line up and organize the primary sources. But as God's creatures, we're also called to interpret the world according to his truth and to think God's thoughts after him, but yeah, as creatures, and uh, to make sure that we declare and, and acknowledge that the good is the good and evil is evil. Yeah, one of the things that I had to deal with is um, uh, writing history for its moral lessons. And now there are pitfalls there in that people can have kind of hagiographical heroes who do no wrong, <laughs> supposedly, allegedly, right? And villains who can never do anything good. And it, it's kind of a distortion because, and if you read your Bible clever, Carefully, you know it's a distortion because of the complexities. The Bible is, you know, quite frank about that kind of thing, in terms of good characters doing sinful things and you know, characters sometimes repenting like Ahab. And uh, the, the world is complicated. People are complicated, and God's plan for the world is complicated. So, all that being said, um, it, there are pitfalls to to using history for moral lessons and although that's been done over and over again it goes back to the greeks even they were you know looking for moral lessons uh, but the 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 upside of it is that we are moral creatures in relation to god who is the ultimate moral standard so you really ought not to keep that out of the total picture uh, that you're bringing to bear when you look at the events in the world. They, there, there are moral issues that are continually coming up. So that's that's part of the uh, issue of, are we just having facts? Uh, are we doing moral evaluations? And on what basis do our moral, moral value, evaluations take place? And do we have enough, enough understanding of the people to be fair to them? Because many times we just, well, you know, only God knows the heart, right? It's a, that's a biblical principle, too. So all the evaluations of people that we're reading about out in extra biblical history have a certain tentativeness to them because of that. But it doesn't mean that there aren't uh, moral aspects to what is going on and and. And I believe then we can see from time to time the operations of God's justice short of the final judgment. And again, it's tentative. And you can see how you can you can go to one extreme or another. There are people who want to be dogmatically judgmental or this happened 
to somebody because he was a wicked person or sure. because he was a good person. Right. And they're rather simplistic about it. But it is true. And the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs shows us that it's true, that there are repeated patterns, that fools get themselves into trouble. And wise people keep themselves out of trouble. <laughs> right. And, right. And it doesn't mean there can't be disasters that come to the wise mm -hmm. and that there can't be uh, times of prosperity that come to the wicked. And Ecclesiastes struggles with the inconsistent but apparent inconsistencies of short range experience. But I think Proverbs and Ecclesiastes together show you that this actual moral dimension of history and the, the dimension of there being short-term rewards and punishments in history, as well as the ultimate final judgment, which you know sorts everything out. But short of that, are there any short-range judgments in history? And the Bible is saying there are. So that's a real challenge to the secularists, right? He wants to say there is no God, or if he is, then he's uninvolved. And it's a challenge to the person who wants never to draw any judgments because we don't know enough. <laughs> yeah, well, we're finite, but we do have some guidance from God. Uh, and I mentioned Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and uh, well, it's worth mentioning Job too, right? Oh, of course. Because because Job is a case of uh, that's partly an object lesson in how not to do it. Right? Yeah, because some of his friends were bad historians. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so it shows some of the challenge of the whole thing. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of thing where you need to say, look, there are these meanings mm -hmm. that are, first of all, in God's mind, some of which we can assess and access uh, on the basis of scripture and others of which remain mysterious right and that that uh, tension between trying to understand the whole history as god would have us understand right. and then still there being mystery that's part of the whole challenge i believe of writing history yeah. of of doing justice both to the revelation that we do have from god and to the limitations uh, that we're not God. Hmm. You do bring that up in the book, speaking of, of God being inscrutable. Uh, he is mysterious. But yet, at the same time, he has revealed himself to us. And so all of us have encountered this when we see, and, you know, when I was uh, serving actively in, in pastoral ministry before, you know, coming to doing what I do at Reform Forum now, you, you know, sometimes you end up with the people in the congregation asking you to interpret world events. And, and we've seen that time and time again in evangelical circles. Let's say a natural disaster happens and somebody says, the Lord has done this because X, Y, and Z, because the government did this, therefore God did this. That would be one pitfall, but the other pitfall would be to say that, you know, things are just happening and have nothing to do with God's hand. And God has revealed himself and he's given to us guidelines and instruction on how we are to think about the world, but we don't have a like a decoder ring that gives gives us uh, the secret wisdom of God relative to all the various specifics that are happening in our world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the that's a challenge and often the frustration, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, though, though I think of Jesus uh, comment, he commented on a couple of well, they weren't exactly natural disasters. One was the Tower, oh, the Tower of Siloam. Siloam. Yeah. Siloam fell on fell on 18 people and killed them. And people concluded, well, there must be worse offenders. Now that's right. this, this uh, Job's friends again, right? right. They're saying there you should have done, some, you must have done something bad. <laughs> it must have been particularly <laughs> wicked. And the Galileans, these blood pilot mingle their sacrifices, were they worst offenders? Jesus raises the question, and then he says, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Well, that's the part that we don't want to hear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because. That's saying any natural disaster is a reminder of the final judgment of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an, an anticipation uh, or related to. Yeah, well, let's speak a bit about common grace on that point. I'm uh, jumping around a bit in my comments, but we want to take the uh, the conversation where it's going. Um, and that's another thing that we see that uh, that often things don't work out in in this simplistic 
uh, A and B or just simplistic causality, I should say, that somebody does something bad and therefore they, e- they, re- they receive the equal and opposite punishment uh, for their error. It's not mechanistic in that way or simplistic. God is not a machine in that way, <laughs> in that way but often he is merciful. And he expresses his common grace for his greater good and greater purposes in history. How should the historian and the historiographer um, account for common grace, for example? How does that factor into the events of history? Well, uh, I mean, you should believe it, right? Um, (laughs) That's the obvious thing. But the thing about common grace is that it's common, you know, that term. I know you know Camden, but... I'm sort of Tell reminding me again. myself too <laughs> sure. that it's common in the sense of not only to uh, the true servants of God, not only sure. to Christian believers, but to everybody. But it's not common in the sense of distributing to everybody equally. There are some things the sun rises on everybody. Uh, uh, so there are some things that come to virtually everybody. But some people have good health and some people do not. Some people are uh, born blind and some people are not. And uh, I think of what God says to Moses when Moses complains, I'm not eloquent. And he says, who made man's mouth? Who made man blind or seeing or hearing or deaf? And, And the unequal distribution of God's gifts is something that I think is very difficult for some of us to accept. There it is in the Bible, and uh, but but if we have the gift of sight, that's a blessing that we don't deserve. So th- there's all kinds of things like that where we say God distributes His gifts lavishly, but not that's sort of at the beginning of history, so to speak, not at the end, right? The the judgment at the end is according to justice, the lavishness at the beginning is according to grace and mercy. And grace in the sense of being beyond what we deserve, but not in the sense of necessarily saying you're saved. <laughs> right? Then that the common grace is making that distinction. So the, the grace is not common in the sense of being equally distributed. And, and we see that, I think, in terms of intellectual gifts, right? If we get back into the academic sphere, some unbelieving, atheist, agnostic, false religion people do very good work academically in terms of their brilliance and their creativity. Well, they're gifted. Where does that gift come from? It must come from God. I think we ought not to have reluctance about that. Although we also got Again, from Van Til, he's teaching both antithesis and common grace. He's going to say there's going to be corruption in those people in their minds as well as in other aspects of their lives because of their unbelief. The form that that corruption takes, however, will vary. And that's, again, the commonality is only a commonality so far. But if, for instance, you're you're deeply immersed in Hindu philosophy in the the Vedantic Hinduism, then they teach that the world is an illusion. Well, you're unlikely to be motivated to do really uh, groundbreaking science within that system. So that's that's a case where we can say, you know, it does make a difference. Uh, And yet many people operate, I think, with happy inconsistency. So... So they have a false religious commitment. Uh, but even though that would, if it was followed consistently, it would undermine the good mm-hmm. things they are doing, yet they go ahead and do them. Well, that's it, it, that's common grace. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that's another, yeah, that is definitely another aspect of it. Not only all the blessings that, that the sin-cursed world receives indiscriminately, uh, but yet fall short of salvation, but also that restraint that God holds back the the wickedness that would be upon this world and the effects of our sin. And he also restrains his final judgment for a time so mm-hmm. that his purposes in history might go forth in terms of his redemptive purposes of saving 
people. And, you know, I like to say to my people often that the reason God has not yet come back in final judgment is because he has more sheep to call into his fold. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. once he calls them all into his fold, then we presume then that'll be the time when the Lord will return and there'll be, you know, it will no longer be the day of salvation. There will, you know, uh, it will be the, the final consummation. And that's history. That's where history is going. And that's how the Christian needs to think about it uh, in terms of the, the larger worldview. But uh, most people don't. Um, I wanted to ask you about the reductionistic views of history because I think it's helpful sometimes by contrast uh, for us to understand how we ought to think when we have some examples of how we how we ought not to think. And and certainly uh, the academic world is is filled with many various reductionistic uh, accounts of history. What are some examples that might prove useful for us? Right. Well, we talked about the meanings, of events, and the people, or or these three, uh, the frame, uh, triad of perspectives. And, and the thing is, because there is one God who rules everything, there is intrinsic harmony between those. We don't need to artificially create it. But if you don't believe in one God, and you, again, try to be consistent, and what tends to happen is you take one of those three things and make it the pretended source of everything else. So what happened there, so you get three kinds of reductionism. Now, the easiest to understand is the reductionism to events. And what you get then is what is some people have called chronicle, not the book of chronicles, but just one event lifted, listed after another with minimal meanings. Now, you can't even list the, the, the events without using words which have meaning. <laughs> <laughs> but There's that problem. But if you just imagine, you know, keeping, you couldn't even keep track of it in a diary. One day would take you more than a day to write everything down that takes place if you get to a certain level right. of minuteness sure. in the events. But you just bring together a long list with no meanings. Uh, that isn't very interesting, but it was the direction that historians began to take when they were stressing just you know, like Friday in the old dragnet, the facts, ma'am, just the facts. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, uh, people just want facts, but the facts, we all know it's, uh, it's uh, hardly digestible unless right. there are meanings. Well, the second reductionism is the meaning. You might think, well, what's the problem with that? But it's what I see happening is what I call these grand schemes of historical uh, analysis uh, that claim to understand the whole course of history in terms of some grand scheme and the movement of some Mm. uh, forces. So Marxism is perhaps the... A most obvious example of this kind of thing, because Marx said that history moved in a certain rigid pattern from feudalism. Well, there were things before that. I'm not sure what he said. Feudalism to capitalism, to the the communist revolution, to a state socialism, to a final communist abundance, which would be the utopia, mm-hmm. and that this was inevitable. Yeah, right. The forces of history guaranteed it. Well. It, it didn't, didn't work. work <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and and what I say and what other people have said, too, is that these grand schemes are always too grand for their own good. Yeah. Right. They're they're simple and they're simplifications. Right. They seem to promise us as a world, the world of understanding. But it's only by leaving out a huge amount and they can be utterly disastrous morally, which I think communist ideology has been because over and over again, people are looking for this wonderful utopia of human blessing and they get, they get mass destruction. (laughs) Uh, So it's just, um, it's very important reductionism that, that has proved very destructive um, in our time. And then the third one is the subjectivistic, the, the existentialist one. And the postmodernists are a good example of that because they've given up on universal meanings. So each person has to create his own meaning. So you write your own narrative, and as you mentioned earlier, no meta narrative—that is, no universal framework. 
but rather each person or each subdivision of society doing its own thing. And, and it's also endorsed, of course, these um, morally committed uh, social, uh, critical sociology analyses that we're seeing some prominence in of people who, who well, that becomes almost more of the system idea because it's heavily morally driven. Uh, but it's often belonging to a certain group. So only the people who are of a certain race can see the meaning of the world right, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, it results in both a subjective emphasis, if it's only our group that sees it right, and a sort of grand moral scheme of we know who are the villains and who are the right. heroes in the, in the story that we're telling of society. Yeah, it's it's very peculiar um, what we're seeing in the world now and the interpretation of history and where it's going. I was just thinking just a couple of weeks ago, I've been reading a lot on history lately of a variety of reasons, and not just history, but historiography and grand theories of, of history. Uh, and, you know, the progressives, uh, however you want to take that word, but progressives are always presupposing that history is progressing somewhere, but there, very few of them will ever explain what the end goal is <laughs> or the principles according to which it just seems to be this assumption that all the all the progressives of a type know where they're going and why but not many of them have even asked the question of of the telos or the the consummation the goal of history but then you also see so many uh postmodern themes you know in academics we thought postmodernism was dead and then all of a sudden it comes back with a vengeance but now it's not merely that, you know, everyone can can uh, have their own interpretation and truth being relative and truth merely being uh, arising within communities. But now it's not enough for everyone to have their own reality. But now you must agree with my interpretation of reality as well. Uh, so it's really the destruction even of tolerance, which for so long was a, a liberal and progressive um virtue, so to speak. But now we, we not only can interpret history and the world any which way we like, but now everyone else is subject to what I've said I've determined. Yeah, so I didn't uh, I didn't discuss this uh, very much in my book directly, but I think the theme of religious roots of the heart being inescapably religious, life is religion, the Kyperian motto, is quite relevant here because uh, I've said more than once that the last idol back, you know, right? These, these idols of schemes of history and and uh, idols of power. And so yes. on the last idol back is the self. Yes. And that's in part what we're seeing because certainly you're and you have a kind of agreement that I'll validate yourself if, provided you validate <laughs> right. myself. Right. <laughs> and right. so then what you have is gross idolatry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of the utmost kind. That's a that's a much more succinct and powerful way to put it. I appreciate that. We're all uh, we're having such a great conversation. We're running out of time. There's we probably haven't even d talked about half the book. We have touched upon all of it in one respect. There's so much here. Allow me to at least ask one more question, maybe two, in our remaining time. But I'm curious, I know that there'll be a lot of uh, disciplined and maybe even professional historians out there uh, who like to listen and might be following up on this, or aspiring students who are studying to be historians or maybe uh, high school teachers or maybe even down the road, seminary professors of that sort. But what are some specific and unique issues involved in academic historical analysis? Uh, all of us are historians of some kind, but if we're engaged in the academic pursuit of history, and that that touches on a lot of people, not just the historians, uh, but what are some of the issues that we need to keep in mind there, and how might we pursue that faithfully, even as a vocation? Right. Well, a good question, uh, and I don't think an easy question to answer, uh, because it uh, at the heart of it is faithfulness to God and to a God who cares for truth. And so we that that calls for all the energy 
uh, both uh, in terms of uh, persistence. Uh, you know, there are Christian virtues <laughs> that are related to the academic sphere of persistence and truth telling and uh, respect for other people and their opinions, even, even though you have to sift them and various kinds of things like that. Uh, it, so that goes into it, but it also means then that the persistence, uh, because you you may have to do a lot of work uh, if you're going to be more rigorous and, and the methods, uh, you're inspecting your own methods critically and trying to do better and better in, in not only your uh, analysis of events, but your analysis of meanings and your analysis of your own limitations. So all that goes into it. But I think in addition, and this I do discuss this in the book, that, that we've gotten this progressive secularization in the West, where many portions of the academic world have anti-Christian standards for how you must research and write. Now, those, those standards are still parasitic on things from Christianity. People, apart from extreme modernists, uh, postmodernists, uh, people still care about truth and what will really happen. Um, but uh, they are trying to suppress the, the presence of God in the midst of history and has suppressed the issues of moral evaluation and so on. So what do you do in a situation like that? And uh, you know, one of the things that, that comes up for discussion is do you just conform to what is expected? Well, sometimes you can do that, I believe, without compromising your conscience in the short run, because you say no historian can write about everything. You have to choose your point of view. You have to choose events you're looking at. And uh, so you do your best within those constraints. And when you're writing to an audience, you do your best within the constraints of that audience, right? So for an academic audience, they're expecting certain things and so on and so on. But but what I think Kuiper realized, and, and he really embodied it in the founding of the Free University of Amsterdam was that there is a distinctively Christian way of doing it. And we, we want to create a space where we don't simply have to play by rules that constrain us in ways that that uh, prohibit us from from you know developing the richness of a christian approach to history and so that's for the long run however and and i want to say you know we're 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 not going to revolution doesn't work <laughs> communist revolution doesn't work but a supposed Christian revolution that would just take things over by force, that's not going to work either. It's not practical, but even if it were practical, we wouldn't be ready for it. We, we wouldn't have the maturity. <laughs> we would be contaminated by our own sins. I'm going to have to call off the militia then, the Christian militia. Yeah, that's and, right. Say this, say this isn't so going to work I, right now. I think we've got to have a great deal of patience and say uh, we've got to work within can, um, situations where we've got a lot of hostility to yeah. faith. and that's true in the West. It it's true in other places too, in other respects. Sure. So so it's nothing new in a sense, but it feels new in the West because the West has so much Christian heritage, which has now been corrupted. But the funny thing about that corruption is it's kind of counterfeits. You know, we talked about the progressives wanting certain goals, or so the goals are still counterfeits of Christian goals of caring for the weak and caring for minority groups and things like that. I can see that really there's no reason for those things uh, without a Christian basis. And they've been, been corrupted. So so the same thing can hold with respect to the whole academic world that we can respect the elements of common grace, even in the standards for history writing. But I have no easy solutions. I think partly you have to live with that tension. And some people are going to decide that, you know, I want to teach at a Christian college or at a Christian high school because I want to be able to talk about God in, in, in a God-honoring way. One of my sons is a 
teacher of biology at Houghton College. Now, Houghton College is uh, now it's Houghton University, but that's that's not Harvard. <laughs> uh, uh, but he can talk about his Christian faith because it's a Christian university, and uh, he can do, he can approach the I issues of biology which he's teaching within a Christian worldview. So, in if different people are going to decide differently, but there's there's I think a real challenge to know how not just to say well we're just going to talk to ourselves because we can't get along with the world. Or we're just going to conform to the world. It's Precisely. Yeah. There can always be this tension, too, in academia for people wanting to have the, the quote, seat at the table. You know, you want to mm -hmm. be accepted and you want to be heard. And so you want, to, you want to do excellent work for God's glory. But also there can be this idolatrous tendency in each and every one of our hearts to, to find the, the accolades and the... Um, you know the prestige that would come with with uh, academic excellence if it's done well, but um, you know there, the the issue of common grace does come up. I'm glad you mentioned that again because oftentimes we can see that we we can engage, perhaps in history more so than some other disciplines, uh, theology or philosophy, for example. <laughs> but in history, you can certainly do the work, and there might be a bit more common grace overlap for a moment. Uh, it's never devoid of, of uh, Christian meaning, and we have to engage in history as Christians always, self-consciously. But what I mean is there, there sometimes can be more opportunity for less hostility. Because if I'm doing a work on Calvin, for example, I can say, well, this is what Calvin uh, believed and why and what was motivating him at the time that he was developing these ideas and what was going on in Geneva, etc., that's one thing uh, in, in the academy to say, this is what Calvin thought and these were his motivations. And here's my reasons for believing that versus, and I believe what Calvin believed as well, <laughs> which is a lot more uh, in your face and, and uh, more difficult. I've found when I've done PhD seminars, you know, obviously, you know, at Westminster, uh, you know, for the historical and theological study side of things, the different field committee that you've been you know, run in the past, but I had to take two external courses. And uh, I did one at Catholic University of America, which is ostensibly a Christian institution, <laughs> although, a, you know, pretty liberal, you know, very different theologically <laughs> than Westminster. <laughs> um, not as many problems there with my thoughts. Uh, but when I went to Temple and took not, not like a Jewish temple, but Temple University, uh, even though I think it was founded as a Baptist institution, you know, it's pretty, you know, the philosophy department where I took a course, very unbelieving. Um, it was a much more of a challenge for me to, you know, operate a, in a course on Michel Foucault. And and even then, I'm just trying to engage in his ideas and just leave my ideas out of it for the seminar discussion and just try to engage. But even there, I found it almost impossible to to just even engage with Foucault's ideas in public without invoking, obviously, with the Lord and and what and and the world that the Lord has created and continues to sustain. So these are always challenges. Uh, trying to have academic engagement, excellence, trying to love our neighbor, and, but yet to speak the truth in love can be quite challenging in these disciplines. And there's yeah, it's a matter of wisdom. There aren't there aren't just simplistic answers to these things. I think. Yeah, I agree, and and I do think that it, there's a good deal that we have to say to, that it depends on the person. You know, some mm. people are going to be more comfortable. Yeah, uh, in a highly combative environment, and other people are just torn apart. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say. I'd rather be in a more peaceful environment. Sure. Yeah, that's true. And uh, sometimes those of us who are more comfortable in a combative environment aren't aren't so for good reasons. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You know, we want to be militant uh, for the sake of the truth. But there's also that that phrase that uh, to bring things full circle that Van Til was so fond of: suaviter in modo, fortiter in re. We always need to be loving and kind, smooth in the way that we share the truth of the gospel, 
but uncompromising in our principles and not seeking to water down or sacrifice uh, the truth of the gospel in in some effort of being winsome, for example. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate your, I think you balanced that. I think that this book is a, just a lovely book. And I think we do find that suaviter and moto fortitur and Ray here. And I appreciate this. What's, do you have another one lined up? Is there another discipline in the queue that we might see a God-centered approach on? I have contemplated. <laughs> I have contemplated redeeming politics. Oh, okay. But well, that's that's like the third rail. <laughs> <laughs> Posthumous. Yeah. You'll, you'll save that for decades from now when it, you'll just write it and put it in a vault, and then it'll <laughs> it can come out. If I do it, one of the first things I will say is, "Look, the Bible does not give you a." Pre- political roadmap mm. of the way that people are looking for if gives us general equity law, right yeah i'm thinking of ask, some themes that in your uh in your book on theonomy yeah mm-hmm. yeah well, there are, but 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 i'm thinking in terms sure. of a political roadmap that, you. You know, that is detailed and i and i i want to challenge people to say to think and say you know why is that what yeah. does God really care about? Mm-hmm. Politics is one area, but I think it tends to get hyped oh, way, yeah. way up. And, uh, you know, people get then politics first and God second. Right. <laughs> and that, I'm deathly afraid of that kind of thing happening, even within the Christian world. Oh, it's certainly there. Yeah, I should make I should correct myself. Uh, the the book, of course, is a shadow of Christ in the law of Moses, which addresses theonomy in places. So, for the listener, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, that's the book. And I appreciate your sympathetic uh, portrayal there, but yet uh, uncompromising and critical. Lots of good good effort there, but I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so, if that book comes along, uh, I'll certainly be interested to read it. But uh, we'll find out. Um, I'm sure we'll hear from some listeners, and if we get some uh, encouragement to that effect, we'll let you know. (laughs) Dr. Poitras, it's always a delight and a pleasure to uh, to speak with you. Thanks for taking some time out of your out of your summer here to speak with me about this book, and I appreciate it. I hope you can have you back again soon sometime. Oh, thank you. Inviting me. Good to talk. Thank you very much. Well, this book here before us, you can see if you're watching the video, here's the picture or the uh, the cover, Redeeming Our Thinking About History, A God-Centered Approach by Dr. Vern Poitras, a professor at Westminster in Glenside, Pennsylvania. Head on over to uh, wts.edu for information about what the seminary is up to. And uh, you can head on over to the frame and share it in uh, the, the uh, frame and portress. Um, uh, apologies, the frame and portress uh, website. We'll, we'll try to have a link to that as well for all of Dr. Portress's articles and books and information about all the lovely things there. Dr. Portress, for those of you who don't know, has just a tremendous amount of material and resources that he's placed online for free. And uh, one of these days, Dr. Dr. Poitras, we need to have our conversation about our views on open source mm-hmm. theology and intellectual property, mm-hmm. Christian ethics and intellectual property. I think that'd yes, be a fun one. Yes. We'll yeah. talk about that someday. And for good, mm-hmm. for old time's sake, perhaps I'll put a, I'll put an AUG version online. We'll see if <laughs> of this, of this episode. But anyway, I do want to thank everybody for, for listening and watching, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.